Chapter 13. I wonder how Katie is doing, Matt was thinking as he shook some snow from his head. I hope she's warm and I hope she's safe. I'll never forgive myself if anything happens to her. Matt frantically looked down at his musket as he tried to figure out how to load it. His shoulders tensed as he thought of the overwhelming task before him. On turning to look at his friend, Matt was horrified to find Israel stooped over on the ground, groaning. Israel, Matt cried, kneeling down beside him. Israel, what is it? What's wrong? Israel didn't answer. He was on his knees, bracing himself with one hand on the ground, and with the other hand he reached for Matt's arm. His body suddenly went rigid as he began to violently throw up. Matt turned his head away, embarrassed, and did not know how to help his friend. When Israel finally exhausted himself, he loosened his grip on Matt's arm. Israel sank back on the ground, trembling. He slowly lifted his head, and Matt winced at the sight of a, a phlegm and blood dripping from Matt, Israel's mouth. Forward on, the call was given to continue the march. Matt and Henry helped Israel to his feet. He could barely stand and weaved unsteadily as he tried to put one foot on in front of the other. Lean on me, Israel, Matt whispered, coming cl close beside him. Together, the two of them kept up as best they could. The pace was extremely slow due to the storm and the poor condition of the road. As Matt looked down, he could see the bloodied snow left by the bare feet of those who had gone before him. After what seemed like hours of marching, Matt could feel the full weight of Israel's body. He suddenly realized Israel had given up trying to walk at all. Henry, help! Matt cried, called, for he and Israel had begun to topple over. Henry reached over and grabbed Israel's arm, and together he and Matt tried dragging him along. They hadn't gone far when Israel sank to his knees again, pulling them down. Matt and Henry got to their feet just as an officer rode by on horseback. Move him to the side of the road, the officer ordered on seeing Israel slumped over in another fit of retching and coughing. As they dragged him off the road, Matt felt something hot on his hand. He looked down and was horrified to see that it was some of the blood that his friend was bringing up. Wiping his hand on the snow, Matt cringed with the thought that it was the first bit of warmth he had felt for hours. Israel was suddenly quiet. The spasms had stopped at the time he didn't try to stand. Come on, Israel, I'll help you, Matt offered, but Israel smiled weakly and shook his head. You'll have to go on without me, he said hoarsely. Oh no, Israel, you can't, you can make it. You can lean on me, Matt cried. We've got to take care of these hissings together, remember? We're a team. Let him be, Henry whispered, pulling Matt away. There's enough here to take care of the Hessians. Israel's fight fighting is over. Let him be. But but we can't leave him here alone, Matt was incredu incredulous. He'll freeze to death. He'll go to his reward either way, Henry told him. Better to let him out of his agony now than to drag him along any further. Come on now, we've got to catch up to the regiment. I won't. I can't, Matt said, fighting back his ears. He's my friend. And friends die, Henry shouted, grabbing onto the front of Matt's sweatshirt and shaking him hard. And you'll die, too, if you stay here with him in the storm. You're, you're sure to freeze to death, don't you see? But Matt wouldn't listen. He pulled himself away and knelt down beside Israel. Stay here, then, you little fool, Henry called it, exasperated. But if you change your mind, just get back on the road and follow it till you find us. And whatever you do, don't fall asleep or you'll never waken. He stood shaking his head and unwrapping the wool stripes, strips that he had wrapped around his hands. He threw them to Matt and in a brisk voice said, Wrap these around yourself and you may save a few fingers. Matt watched as he unbuttoned the blue cuffs on his coat and pulled them down over his own bare knuckles. Then, without another word, Henry Shudder turned and ran until he finally disappeared into the long stream of soldiers that moved along the road. Matt put his arm around Israel, who seemed to be dozing. He wondered if Israel even knew he was with him. As a steady line of men marched past, Matt grew panicky with fear. He longed to call out to them to stop and take that him with them. He saw that most of them had their hands, heads lowered and didn't even notice him, and those that did give gave him a mournful nod and quickly looked away. I wish we were going with them, Matt thought, now jealous of those on their way to battle. At least we would have had a chance. What chance do we have now? He was suddenly overcome with the strong, ammonia scent of urine. Looking down, he could see that Israel had wet himself and didn't even seem to know it. Matt took the rags that Henry had thrown him and laid them over Israel's wet pants. It was all he could think to do. 
his eyes filled with tears as he realized just how helpless Israel had become and how desperate their situation was because of it. Maybe Henry was right, he thought. Maybe friends do die, but that doesn't mean that you have to die with them. Maybe he won't even miss me, Matt thought, looking at Israel's closed eyes. I don't want to die. I want to live. I want to live, he whispered. Slowly taking his arm from around Israel, Matt reached over and picked up his musket, stood up, and was about to join the soldiers filing past when Israel suddenly opened his eyes and smiled. Go on then, Matthew. Go on ahead. It's all right. I'm just going to take a little nap, he said, curling up in a frozen on the frozen ground. Matt's musket fell from his hands as he sank back in the snow. No, Israel, stay awake. You've got to stay awake, he cried, pulling his friend up against a tree. Israel blinked and his eyes met Matt's. Don't worry, old goat, Matt said, holding him in his arms. I'm here with you. I'm not going anywhere, he whispered softly. Then with his half-frozen fingers, he brushed the snow for Israel's cheek. My pouch, Israel said faintly. Can you get it for me? It's in my pack. Matt reached into the pack on Israel's back and pulled out the small leather pouch. The beads. Put them in my hand so I can see them, will you? Israel asked. Sure, Matt replied, opening the bag. Then he uncurled Israel's half-frozen fist. The fingers had become blistered and were turning purple with the cold. Matt held the pouch upside down and carefully shook it. Unseeing the pretty blue beads, Israel smiled. They are fine, aren't they? He sighed. Matt looked down at the delicate little beads that were so gently cradled in the dirty fro in the dirty frozen hand. Very fine, Matt whispered. Promise me, Matthew, that you'll get them to her. Israel said, struggling to keep his head up. Miss Abigail Gates on the Dinbury Road, Haverston, Massachusetts. He slumped back down on out of breath. What are you talking about? Matt wiped at the tears falling from his cheek. Of course she'll get them. We're going to bring them to her together. Remember, you did invite Katie and me to come and visit you and Abby and the boys. We're going to bring Abby the beads together, Israel. We are. Israel shook his head weakly as he breathed, as his breathing became more labored. Please promise me, he gasped. I promise, I promise, Matt said, pulling him to his chest. Miss Abigail Gates on the Dinbury Road, Haverston, Massachusetts. Don't worry, Israel Gates. You have a friend in Matthew Carlson, he whispered softly as the tears on his face began to freeze. You can depend on it. Ms. Israel could no longer speak, but Matt could feel him thanking him with his hand, with his eyes. Matt put the beads in his sweatshirt pocket, keeping his other arm around his friend. They sat huddled together like that for a long time. The steady stream of soldiers passing before them began to blur as Matt's field of vision narrowed. The howling of the wind seemed to lessen, and an enticing quiet, crep quiet crept over the landscape as the snow silently encased the two comrades in this frozen cocoon. Matt felt his eyes beginning to close, and to help him fight the urge to sleep, he began to talk. He told Israel all about himself and his life in the future. Israel seemed to be going in and out of consciousness as Matt rattled on about dirt bikes, VCRs, and pizzas. Oh, and yeah, Batman. I got to tell you about Batman. See, there's this guy, Bruce Wayne, who's living in Gotham City. Are you listening, Israel? Chapter 14. Wake up, wake up, son. Come now. It's no time for sleeping. Matt could hear a deep voice calling. It sounded as if there were, if as if it were coming from the end of a tunnel. He groaned as the voice got louder. I'm getting up, Dad. I am. Matt mumbled with his eyes still closed. Tell mom I don't want any breakfast. I've got gym first period today and I'll just throw up if I have to eat anything, he moaned. I'm glad to hear that you still have enough life in you to be talking about breakfast, the deep voice replied. There you are on your feet. Matt opened his eyes and found himself standing or rather leaning on a heavy set man in a brown wool coat. He was an older man with a bushy gray eyebrows and a bristly mustache. Dad, is that you, Dad? Matt croaked. The man smiled, shaking the, the snow from Matt's head. No, lad, I'm not your father. My name is Nathan Hornby. You're just a bit confused, it's all. Come on, then. You need to thaw out and get some of that breakfast you were groaning about. My farm is just through these woods, not an hour's ride. We can take my best here, he said, walking Matt to his horse. Matt blinked hard and suddenly realized where he was. Israel, he called out. My friend is sick. He said, turning to face Mr. Hornby, you've got to help me with him, Matt pleaded. He looked behind him, searching for Israel, but Mr. Hornby quickly turned, turned him around. No, lad, don't look back there, he said. 
keeping his large gloved hands on Matt's shoulders. I'm afraid there's nothing more to be done for your friend now, but I can't leave him, Matt protested, wriggling out of the old man's grasp and running from him. When Matt reached the tree, he let out a sound that was half crying, half scream, for there lying on his back was Israel. Matt knew it was Israel because he could see the bit of blue from the old coat that stuck out of the snow and the bright red sneaker with its frozen laces all undone. There was a little else there was little else to recognize, for the storm had left its gruesome mark, erasing Israel's face in a cover of snow. I can't leave him, I can't, Matt sobbed. A hey, lad, you can, Mr. Harnby said gently, for he's left himself. He's no longer there, but in God's glorious kingdom. The old man put his arm around Matt and guided him to the horse. The pictures are just down the road, Mr. Hornby whispered. There are Tories living all through these parts, and if Colonel Rawl is alerted, these woods would be crawling with Hessian jaggers and rebel hunters. We must make haste. But Matt was so exhausted and overcome with grief that he began to topple over. He remembered little of Mr. Hornby's lifting him onto his horse or the ride to the Hornby farm. When Matt finally came to his senses, it was his sense of smell that came alive first. He sniffed the sweet aroma of wood smoke and apples. On opening his eyes, he found himself lying before a large fireplace. Several black cast iron pots and kettles hung from an iron arm that swung out over the fire on the pot closest to Matt, a brew of spicy apple cider was slowly shimmering, shimmering, simmering. Matt yawned, lazily savoring the delicious feeling of warmth that had spread over him. The bitter cold and dampness of the night before seemed far away as Matt snuggled down under the cozy mountain of wool blankets that had been piled on him. It was such a relief to feel good, finally, that he decided not to think about it and to just feel it. But as soon as he decided not to think about it, he couldn't stop thinking about it. Why do I feel so good? Matt wondered. And where am I? Looking down beneath the blankets, he could see that he was no longer in his clothes. Instead, he had a long white nightgown with ruffles around the collar and cuffs. He winced, instinctively knowing that it was a woman's garment. As Matt looked around, he could see that the room was not very big, with one small window affording the only light. Matt looked out the window and saw that it was an overcast day. He wondered what time it was. He looked past the window to see a long, narrow table with some wooden bowls on it. In a corner, corner there was a spinning wheel, a basket overflowing with raw wool set beside it. In another corner, a woman was sitting at a loom. She was dressed very plainly in long skirts and a white apron. The expression on her face was as drab as a green colored shawl that she wore over her shoulders her gray hair was pulled back tight in an angry little bun and the only sound that she made was a whack 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 of her loom every now and then she would stop to nervously scratch at a scab on her face mrs pritchett matt thought on seeing her she looks just like crabby old mrs pritchett from the second grade suddenly the woman looked up and on seeing matt awake her thin lips curled down into a frown she dropped the shuttle from her hand and rushed for the room. Matt could hear her shrill, tinny voice. Nathan, Nathan, he is awake, she cried. Calm down, Temperus. He's, she's, he's only a child. Bring us no harm. Coming into the room. He, he's been here is harm enough, snapped the old woman angrily behind him. Mr. Hornby took a cup from a shelf and let, ladled some cider into it. He knelt down beside Matt and blew into the cup, testing to see if it was cool enough to drink. It's hot, lad, but it will do you good, he said, carefully offering the cup to Matt. Matt thanked him and took a sip. Israel, my friend, is he, is he? Yes, he's gone, Mr. Hornby said gently, and you were close to being gone with him. I would have passed right by if a drummer hadn't stopped me and asked me to look out for you. Henry? Matt cloaked. I don't know what his name be, but he right saved your life. I was out along the Pennington Road, returning from my sister's farm, when I met up with the militia. If I hadn't known Major Horse personally, I being a neighbor of his, I would have been taken for a spy for sure. They were that jittery, you see. But after Major Horse assured them of my loyalties, I was given clearance to proceed to my farm. 
Mr. Hornby reached for a small iron hook that hung beside the fireplace. He used it to lift a lid of a pot that was covered with hot coals. Matt could smell the rich aroma of a hearty stew as Mr. Hornby ladled some into a bowl. Try this, son. It will give you strength, he said, handing the bowl to Matt. Now, where was I? Oh, yes, on the Pennington Road. It was as foul a night as I've ever seen, and the brave lads were trudging along when this drummer waved me over, Mr. Hornby explained. He told me that you and your friend were down at the fork in the road, and he asked me if I could assist you. Can you remember any of that of last night, then? Mr. Hornby looked down kindly at Matt. Matt shuddered looking over to the fire as the memory of the night before came rushing back. It's like a dream, he whispered, like a fantastic dream, and it got so horrible I couldn't wake up from it. I feel like I still can't, Matt moaned. 